So hi Liz, I'm, I'm really interested in clouds at the moment, namely because we've got a collection out which is inspired by clouds, which is um, uh, actually made out of aluminium. So we've been trying to capture the kind of ephemeral nature of, of clouds in a hard material. And we thought we'd speak to the experts and there is no greater expert than you. Than you. Uh, I was interested particularly in our shared history, actually. Um, I know noticed that you were from Huddersfield and I was born in Tunisia um, but my uh, I came from um, North Africa to Huddersfield when I was uh, I think four in the coldest winter that uh, ever existed which is 63. 63 yes and, um, so slightly before my time but my dad will talk about 1963 because he was a, a big football player at the time and he, he he couldn't play for about four months it was so cold yeah one of the yeah. worst winters we've had. So I think my, my you know my uh, my opinion of the weather has been formed by my arrival in, in Huddersfield from the <laughs> clear and sunny skies of um, Tunisia, actually I was in Egypt at the time, to the, the freezing cold, dark grey skies of, of Huddersfield. And I think what's kind of interesting, uh, particularly about clouds, you know, the perception um, of foreign uh, foreigners about the UK is that it's a particularly cloudy and foggy country. Is that true? Yeah, so I, I agree. And I think even in the UK, we often see clouds as, clouds as a nuisance. So it gets in the way of the sun. You know, we have sayings like, you know, cloud on the horizon means there's a kind of negative impact of something that's going to happen. Uh, and we do. But there are other parts of the world that see clouds as a real, you know, a real positive. And they're usually countries that don't tend to get clouds very often. You know, really hot, sunny countries that actually really appreciate when they, there is a bit of cloud cover and they see clouds as a real positive. So it's interesting how different nations view clouds in either a positive or a negative way. Well, I was, I was kind of interested in, in that as well, given as though, you know, clouds are so important in, uh, well, I mean, they're fundamental in, in bringing uh, the, the important water to, to everywhere and, and, and the way that, that people have been trying to manipulate them, that, you, that humans have been trying to manipulate cloud cover um, yeah. to increase rainfall. Is that something that you think will um, happen more and, and is it actually a solution to some of the big, big problems of fresh water in the world? So yeah, it's called cloud seeding. So people f actually force uh, what particles into the air to form water droplets and clouds and then hopefully rainfall. Uh, and it either is trying to make rainfall happen somewhere else so that they can protect their crops or it's trying to produce rainfall, so clean water for people to use for living on. So it can actually be used in both ways to kind of get rid of rainfall somewhere else or to produce rainfall. So for example, the Beijing Olympics that happened a few years ago, they did some cloud seeding to try and make it rain somewhere else during the opening ceremony they wanted to keep Beijing dry and so about 30 kilometers away from Beijing it absolutely hammered it down with rain and caused lots of actual flooding problems for that part of the region but Beijing itself stayed dry so this is already happening people are already using the cloud seeding method to try but it, it it's it's I would say it's something that you have to really be careful with you know you're messing with nature and uh, you know that there are consequences of, of trying to move water around to, to displace water from one place to provide water in another so there'll be some winners and some losers in this so it's a it's one of those it's, it's definitely a, a political discussion because some countries use cloud seeding more actively than others. So I, I noted also on, on your website that the, the COVID pandemic has actually affected some of the um, the chemistry of the clouds in, in a positive way. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, COVID's been really interesting, actually, because um, when we went into the first lockdown, a global lockdown, uh, there was a huge drop in the amount of pollutants in the atmosphere. And pollutants are what we call cloud condensation nuclei. So they're the particles that the, the water vapour will condense onto to form a water droplet. And so we saw a huge reduction in cloud condensation nuclei. So the effect was that we were seeing less clouds in certain parts of the world uh, because of that big reduction in, in the pollution in those cloud condensation nuclei. So we, we did see some dramatic changes. We also saw the effect because we were losing a number of observations. So a lot of planes weren't flying around 
uh, the, the world and they take observations for us, weather observations, which we put in our numerical models to give us our weather forecast. So we saw a big drop in the observations and actually a, a slight deterioration in the, in the quality of weather forecast. So impacts in different ways. So you were talking earlier about the, the weight of clouds. I mean, I've always thought of clouds that I guess most people do as, as weightless and, and because they float in the air. But can you tell us about, about the weight of clouds? Yeah, so if you imagine a cloud that's about a metre cube, so a metre wide, a metre deep and a metre uh, width, um, there's about five grams of water in of water droplets in a cloud that size. So now scale that up to one of these big thunderstorm clouds, huge clouds that goes through the whole depth of the atmosphere. Uh, we have about the weight of all the water. If you if you measured all the weight of the water, it's about four hundred thousand grams, or the weight of about hundred elephants in that huge cloud. But each of the water droplets in there is is light enough to be suspended in the air. It's only when you bring all those water droplets together and try and weigh them in one, I guess, mass is where you get that huge mass, that that four hundred tons of of weight in the whole cloud itself. 400 tons. So, so, and then the, the, the cloud cover in the whole world multiplied by, by the weight of cloud. I mean, how heavy is, is, is uh, the cloud covering of the earth at the moment? I, I wouldn't have an exact figure for that, but but interestingly, if you if you look at the average cloud cover across the whole world, it covers two thirds of the earth at any one time, typically. So, you know, at any one time, two thirds of the earth is covered in cloud and only a third is open. And that, that might be quite a surprise to some people who imagine, you know, there's large parts of the world that have, you know, little cloud or no cloud. But actually, if you look at the whole expanse equator to the poles, two thirds of the earth is covered in clouds. That's absolutely extraordinary. I didn't know that. I'm learning a lot in this call already. <laughs> Um, so tell us a bit about the Weather Club then. It seems like I've got quite a lot to learn, so maybe I should join your club. Yeah, so uh, so I work for the Royal Meteorological Society and we're a, a learned society, so we support the scientists and those working in, in meteorology. But I launched the Weather Club about a decade ago because we're fascinated by the weather in, in the UK and other parts of the world. It's, it's one of those topics that people will spark a conversation with a stranger about. You'll meet somebody in the street and say, oh, it's cold today or it's wet today or it's beautiful, the sun's out. And you'll have those conversations about the weather. And so we realized that we had an engaged audience who not only was interested in the weather, but wanted to find out more. Those kind of explainers, well, why, why is the weather doing what it does? Why is it so wet at the moment? Why is it so cold? at the moment and so we provided a platform to be able to to bring the weather and climate to life to, to allow us to explain and educate people about what the weather is doing and why it does it not only here in the UK but but anywhere in the world so again it was just recognizing there was a really interested audience of people who were fascinated by the weather and an opportunity to talk to them about it and is, is that a peculiarly British obsession Yes, it is. I've been interviewed many times by international journalists who will say, why are you so obsessed by the weather in the UK? And there are other countries that do, you know, are very interested in the weather, but we, we seem to have this extra kind of obsession, fascination here in the UK. And I think it's because the weather changes so much in the UK. You know, you can often find in one day you might have three seasons. You know, you get up in the morning, it's cold and frosty and icy by lunchtime. The sun's got to work. You might be walking around in your T-shirt and then in the middle of the afternoon, there's a heavy shower. And we, it impacts so much on what we can and can't do that I think it's that changeable nature of the weather in the UK that makes us just that bit more interested in it. And, and so this perception that, that the UK is foggier than everywhere else, which is, I think, comes from maybe Sherlock Holmes or something. I don't know where it comes from. Or, or maybe it comes from um, the uh, Industrial Revolution and smog uh, might also be a fact. I mean, what, what's your view? 
Yeah, I, I agree. So that this kind of foggy nature goes back to the kind of 1800s, mid 1800s, uh, when we did have a lot of pollution from, you know, coal burning, wood burning in cities that pull up, put again, these cloud condensation nuclei into the atmosphere. So all these water droplets formed, but formed at the surface. And we got not just fogs, but what we call smog. So lots of pollutants mixed up in, in the cloud that's on the ground. Fog basically is just cloud that's at the surface. That's all it is. So if you've ever wondered what it's like to walk or float around in the clouds when it's a foggy day that's the kind of experience that you'd have if you were up in the clouds somewhere um but yes yeah, so i think uh, we, we it, it, and it, again christmas is another example so we look back to the kind of charles dickens and the the christmas carol and you know it, it was a period where we were run, going through a cold spell and there was lots of snow around and we imagine christmas therefore to be white crisp snowy scenes and we don't get white christmases that often here in the uk so i think both of those go back to the kind of historical days of of you know the kind of 1800s when well, the weather in the UK was was different. So, but it's, it's snowing right now, and, and, and the clouds are are significantly different when they're laden with snow. Is that is that also? Uh, I mean, that's just because of the crystals, or what? What is that effect of a darker snow cloud? Yeah, exactly. You'll, you'll often look at the sky and, and even before it starts snowing, you can you can see the intensity in the cloud. You can see it's laden with, you know, s snowflakes, snow crystals uh, that are ready to fall to the sky. There's a different feeling in the sky. And you're right, it's down to the nature of the difference in a rain water droplet. So as a as a liquid form compared to a snowflake or ice uh, as, a, as a solid form in the cloud, it just brings a different nature. And it's all really Really to do with how light reflects off these particles. So a water droplet, the light will penetrate through the water droplet, but with ice and, and snowflakes, the water is reflected off the, the ice crystals. So we get different kind of uh, visual perspectives, whether it's liquid form or solid form, so rain or snow. And, and what was the, the, the other fascinating thing from my perspective is the way that they generate sound and, and light as well. You know, the lightning and the thunder that comes from a cloud. Is that the cloud doing that or is that, uh, tell, tell us a bit about that science there. Yeah, so the, the thunder clouds, the big, uh, they're called cumulonimbus clouds, the air is moving up and down in that cloud. There's lots of turbulence, lots of energy in, in, in uh, thunder clouds. And as the particles move up and down, they rub up against each other and kind of cause a bit of friction, uh, a bit of static in the cloud. And eventually that static starts to kind of level out. So you get all the positive charges at one end and all the negative charges at the other. And eventually the cloud wants to release all the that static and that's when we get lightning bolts lightning cracks of lightning as the the static is released it tries to find a point typically at, at ground but sometimes you get lightning between clouds uh, but if, if it reaches the ground it'll look for the highest point so a, a church spire a tall bridge uh, a tree for example to release all of that static all of that energy and that's the lightning bolt and in a lightning bolt, the temperature is, it's about 40,000 degrees Celsius. It's a phenomenal heat. And that heat then expands the air around it. And it's as that air expands quickly, you send out a sound wave and that's the thunder. Uh, and light travels faster than sound. So often you see the lightning first and then a few seconds later, you'll hear the thunder. So it's an electrical explosion effectively. It is an electric charge that builds up in the in the cloud, and then it's a release of that. So it's an explosion of, of that uh, that electric charge. So and, and then you've been um, naming the clouds a, a bit in the conversation. Tell us a bit about this uh, quite complex way of, of uh, classifying them and, and, and how you name the clouds. Yeah, so an interesting character, a gentleman called Luke Howard, uh, was the person who classified the clouds back in the early 1800s. So before that, different countries would name different clouds in different ways. And it was very difficult to uh, to speak to other meteorologists about clouds because we all had different ways of naming them. But Luke Howard in the early 1800s classified the clouds quite simply. We can think of three different cloud types. So we've got the cumulus cloud, which are the white, fluffy, look like cotton wool balls floating in the sky sky. 
and cumulus means kind of heaped so that the heaped kind of fluffy clouds that we have then we have stratus clouds which are layered clouds so they're quite flat they're fairly nondescript um you know layered clouds that we have and then we have cirrus clouds so cirrus in in latin means a kind of wisp of hair or a tuft of hair and these are usually the ice crystal clouds that are very high up in the atmosphere and you see these beautiful wisps of clouds uh you know that might not actually block out the sun they're they're quite high and and quite um transparent in a sense uh, through the cloud themselves but and then we combine these so we can take a cumulus and a stratus and we've got cumulus stratus so that's heat clouds that start to layer out into the stratus layer so we do wonderful things but if you think about those three groups cumulus heaped stratus layered and cirrus the little wisps of hair I thought it was Aristotle that had started naming the clouds, but you're, you're, you're saying it's much more recent than that. So Aristotle did. There were various people. So the French really advanced naming of clouds, but we were all doing things very differently. And it was Luke Howard that brought us all together. Uh, in, it was the early 1800s. I think it was 1803. Uh, he produced a paper and uh, named the cloud. And everybody since then around the world have been using these these cloud names, this cloud classification. So it, it just brought us together to have a kind of communal language around clouds. And so is, is the society unique in the world um, in terms of, of its constitution? I mean, is there equivalence elsewhere? Yeah, so um, there are about 70 meteorological societies around the world. We're probably the third largest behind the American Met Society and the Chinese Met Society. We've certainly the, the longest established. We've been in existence in eight, since 1850, so just over 170 years old. But there are lots of other Met Societies out there that support the science of meteorology, the people that work in, in science or study meteorology, so the profession as well. Uh, and, and again, we come together uh, in kind of international conferences to share the science and, and the profession of meteorology globally as well. And um, if, if you were going to recommend, I mean, here, here on the south coast, and of course, you know, by the seaside, you get a lot of sky and great sunsets. So the clouds are kind of amazing. Where would you recommend um, cloud watching? So it depends what you want to see. If you're into thunder clouds, then there's certain parts of the world, particularly as you get closer to the equator, where we get lots of air going up, there's lots of heat and energy taking the air up and forming these thunder clouds. If you like thunderstorms, you like the dramatic thunder clouds, then somewhere closer to the equator. Again, if you well, go to a that. Not, not at no, the no. moment, absolutely. Uh, you know, if you go to the US, you can see tornadoes, which are obviously the, the vortex of clouds that develop. So again, very dramatic. But actually, there's a real beauty in clouds. So even in the UK, you know, if you get a lovely day, just go outside, just stop, but look up at the sky. There's some beautiful shapes, colours. Uh, you know, as you say, that the light can change almost, uh, you know, within within the space of a few minutes as the clouds kind of move across the sky. So, you know, it's just about stopping, uh, taking taking a breath in your day, going outside and looking up at the sky. Okay, and so where, where um, I think we've got so much information already, so so we, we could probably wrap up and and, and have three um, three broadcasts there. But um, we're 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 actually launching this collection in in Sweden um, early next week. So you got any predictions for cloud cover um, in in Scandinavia, uh, say on Wednesday or Thursday? So, well, Scandinavia, as most of Northern Europe, like ourselves at the moment, are in the grips of this very cold air that's come all the way from Russia. So uh, there's lots of uh, crisp cold air, hopefully uh, a few wispy clouds kind of moving through the ice clouds. Everything in the air at the moment in Northern Europe is frozen. Uh, so you're going to see lots of ice crystals, lots of snowflakes uh, floating around in those clouds. Uh, not a drop of rain, I don't think, for, for Stockholm this week. Okay, and, and that is actually um, coming to the UK after, after, it's coming from that direction at the moment, isn't it? So their filthy weather is going to come and hit us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we're, the weekend, right? Yeah, so we, we, we've got the same air of, uh, flow of air from Russia that, that Sweden have, and most of Northern Europe are in the, the grips of what we're calling the beast from the east. Okay, great. Well, a great way <laughs> to finish with that prediction for Sweden. Okay, so thanks a lot for your time, Liz. That's been fascinating. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and catch up again. I'm gonna join your society. Okay. Brilliant. Thank Great, you. thanks, Tom. I hope it all goes well this week.
All right. Bye, Ben. Bye. Bye.